Hi guys, welcome to Found Flicks. Jamie here. Today we're talking about one of the greatest members to the horror canon, including one of my personal favorites, the Phantasm series, as well as our thoughts on its latest and fifth edition, Ravager. The latest and potential series finale, Ravager, reveals new truths that impact the entire film series and contains connections that reveal themes that bring the films full circle. So let's step through the dimensional fork and explore the world of Phantasm. Boy. So let's be real about the question we're all curious to ask, is number five really the end? Ravager does tie up many story threads for the series and feels like a proper finale. And yes, of course we're all in mourning over the loss of Angus Scrim, who portrayed the iconic tall man. He was definitely a scary mofo on screen, but it's funny because he was actually the total opposite in real life. He appreciated every one of his fans and had a really close relationship with Don Coscarelli. When asked about the future of the series, concerns were focused on how to continue the journey without the irreplaceable Angus Scrim. Envisioning Phantasm without the tall man seems almost disrespectful. I don't personally feel a sixth entry should be ruled out, but even with the five we have, the universe really becomes more realized and intriguing. If we were to consider parts one through four alone, which were written and directed by series creator Don Coscarelli, it vastly changes the perspective of the series' vision and meaning. With the addition of five, we are compelled to reinterpret events from every entry in the franchise. Whichever interpretation you ascribe to, it's crucial to consider each entry's contribution to the evolution of the series. It's also important to note that Ravager is the first film in the series that showcases Reggie, our ever-loving shotgun-wielding ice cream and ladies man as the main character. Previously, we focused on Mike, but as Ravager picks up right where four left off, Mike is presumably dead, and with older brother Jody having died in a car crash back in part one, and his evil doppelganger killed twice in part four, we're left only with Reggie to solve the mystery of the tall man and ultimately save the world. Because the tall man, those deadly spheres, and the demonic dwarves are ravaging the planet one live or dead body at a time. Beware, not even the highways are safe from the spheres anymore. <laughs> A cool aspect is the beginning sequence, told through flashbacks, which really helps explain the history of the Tall Man, aka Jebediah Morningside. For people unfamiliar with the series, or for those of us who might need a refresher, this is a good starting point to lay the groundwork. We are first introduced to the Tall Man's Jebediah alter ego in part four, and theorize that his transition to evil results from his trips through the dimensional fork, a construction presumably of his own invention, allowing him to travel between dimensions. As he traveled more and more through the fork, he became affected by the Process, becoming a transient evil force. Phantasm 4 is really our first exploration of the tall man's past. Mike has a series of dreams or visions in which Jebediah appears before he officially meets him. Well, we say before, but keep in mind that time and dimensional crossovers are heavily obscured in the series. First, there's a vision of what appears to be a Civil War battlefield in which an unconscious Mike is strapped to a table in a tent while the tall man, or Jebediah, inserts a long slender object into his nose, similar to a lobotomy device. Let's be clear on one thing though, it's never explicitly stated why the tall man has an obsession with Mike, except at the beginning of part four, where Reggie does say that the tall man is grooming him to take his place. The tall man wants to transform him into one of his kind. In multiple scenes, the tall man instructs others not to kill Mike, tells Reggie to take good care of him, and in part four, even saves Mike from suicide, saying that he is the only one with dominion over his soul. Can we then trace back the origin of their connection to this Civil War era bocce surgery? Why is Mike in a Civil War battlefield, and what's special about Mike that draws the tall man to him? In part three, Mike finally asks the tall man what he wants with him, but his response is only to walk off into the dimensional portal. We don't really know yet. But based on what's given to us, it seems in some sense Mike is being groomed to either take the tall man's place or to become a significant element to his army. Or maybe his brain is just the perfect breeding ground for the ultimate gold ball? In part four, we also witness the first official, at least conscious, meeting between Jebediah and Mike. He appears as a somewhat wealthy, judging by the stature of his plantation-esque comb, southern man, perhaps a doctor or a scientist, who asks Mike where he's from as he doesn't look like he's local, then chimes in, Did you make passage through the dimensional fork? So Jebediah has seemingly and unknowingly created a crossover point between dimensions, and already it's out of his control if he doesn't know who and when beings are crossing over. As death is a central focus of the series, I personally feel that the portal was invented to escape it. One of the things that makes the series great, and shall I say cerebral, is its purposeful ambiguity about some elements, leaving a lot of the details of the universe up for interpretation. Ravager continues this motif, but gives us enough answers to satisfy long-term fans. And really, that's one of the best parts of Ravager, that it seems truly created for hardcore fans. It reintroduces some noteworthy favorites of Yore, the Lady in Lavender from the original, and Rocky, 
who debuted in Phantasm 3, my personal favorite of the series. We also have newcomers Dawn, Reggie's token love interest, who later reappears as parallel universe identity Jane, and Chunk, a member of the Rebel Army who's kind of a badass. For all you Fringe fans out there, it's a welcome mindfuck. Now let's talk about consciousness. In Ravager, Mike visits Reggie at a mental institution. Note, Mike was in a mental institution in part two for seven years following the death of his parents and brother and informs him that he's been diagnosed with dementia. Mike seems completely oblivious to any events related to the tall man or his impending threat meaning he's also forgotten or is choosing to dismiss his own institutionalization, and it seems more likely that this is all some sort of construction by the tall man to keep Reggie away from Mike. Reggie even tells Mike in discussion about the tall man that he should know more than anyone else. So what's wrong with this picture? Mike responds by describing his reading about parallel universes that a person can be in multiple places at once. And there's another theory, that all dimensions are stacked, and at the point where these dimensions touch, dot dot dot. And really that's our key to the Phantasm universe, the dimensional portal is our gateway between time and space. So who happens to be Reggie's roommate? Good old Jebediah, who at first seems like a tired old man, but later warns Reggie that he'll never be safe, I'm always watching you. This becomes a central conflict to Ravager, can Reggie break through this cognitive consciousness barrier of false versus true reality? In an iconic scene, Reggie passes through the fork into an all-white, atmospherically void dimension with only the tall man. When Reggie asks where they are, the tall man responds, not where. When. It's a phrase mentioned more than once in the series. The tall man promises to give Reggie his family back if he stays out of his way and lets his plan complete, in which he also claims a better future for everyone. But he reinforces his possession over Mike. He is mine. Always. Reggie, of course, doesn't buy the pitch and backs up through the fork once more, only to end up in the old mausoleum with our friend the Lady in Lavender. One of my favorite scenes shows Reggie in a standoff with the tall man, asking if he's considered his offer. Reggie says he doesn't want the reanimated zombies of his family, but that he would take his friends, Mike and Jody. When the tall man asks about Reggie's obsession with these two men, Reggie defines it as loyalty. The tall man describes humans as skin sacks of water and meat, and at this stage seems to define himself as something beyond our kind, of which we're already aware, but it's the lines about hell that are most revealing. Yours or mine, one might say we're in it together. So religion doesn't dominate this universe. Sorry guys, you're my bad dream. Finally, Reggie crosses over to the dimension where a rebellion is taking place, a group of humans uprising against the tall man and his cronies. It's Jane, Don's double, and Chunk. They think he's a random survivor and attempt to bring him back to medical attention and a safe camp. Chunk says the device trapping Reggie is used to extract the intel he, the tall man, needs via memories, hopes, and dreams. If we look closely, we see that the device is actually a miniature dimensional fork placed on the temporal lobes. If the larger dimensional forks allow us to physically transport between dimensions, then the smaller ones would imply gateways between psyches, consciousness, dreams, and even astral planes. We can then assume that all the forays into Reggie's memories of his past have been via this device, that some people are stuck in this state indeterminably. It's possible that Reggie knew or had met Jane from this dimension and reinvented her in a dream state while under restraints of the device. But more likely, as Chunk explains, he was also under the device for a long time. Thus again, we explored a shared consciousness in which Don, who was actually Jane through Chunk's memories, entered Reggie's consciousness. But who knows? All that really matters is that Reggie gets a gun again. Let's rock, babe. So we have to assume that everything leading up to him awakening from the machine was a construct of the tall man to fuck with Reggie. And when confronted with other members of the rebellion, when removing his mask is revealed to be Mike. We have cohesion. Mike tells Reggie he's been on ice for a decade, ever since we blew him up in the desert. This is a reference to the end of part four, in which the tall man and his hearse are blown up only to prompt another tall man inexplicably appearing through the dimensional fork. Whatever we do or don't know about the other Reggies we've seen, the Reggie we are following now is the same we saw at the end of Phantasm 4. And maybe after following the tall man through the dimensional fork is when he was taken and put under the tall man's mind control device. Now we're exposed to a war-torn and demolished reality in which the tall man has reanimated the dead as members of his army, and the environment is destitute and dying. And we finally find out what happened to Mike after the end of Phantasm 4. He and Reggie share dreams, while Reggie, back in the mental institution, is busy explaining his confused consciousness from traveling through multiple realities, Mike busts in to tell him that he's had Reggie's dream, 
which picks up at the end of part four, in which he's wandering the desert with a gaping yellow hole in his head looking for Reggie. Did he actually put something in there, or was it always there? Here's the thing, I can still feel the connection to him. This isn't the first time we've seen shared dreams in the series, a la Mike and Liz in Phantasm 2. Liz grew up dreaming of and fantasizing, as in sketching Mike's face and drawing hearts around it in her diary, whom she'd never met. Mike simultaneously has dreamt of her and talks about her to Reggie. It's through these shared dreams that a connection is created as well as a desire to form a physical union. The shared dreams of Mike and Liz as well as those of Mike and Reggie suggest a connection beyond our reality or a singular dimension, reinforcing the concept of infinite realities. So what happened next? Governments collapsed, society crumbled, an alien virus was unleashed, people were sick, their heads would swell up until they popped. There was no cure, it was bad shit. Hello Phantasm 4, where Mike ends up in a strange place talking to doppelganger slash evil ball Jody, who says they can't stay there due to the risk of infection. Phantasm 4 already started building a feeling of anxiety about an impending apocalypse. In the opening scenes, Mike tells us as he's driving down a deserted highway that there's hardly anything left alive. And already in part two, Mike and Reggie take off on a quest to hunt the tall man down, going from town to town and cemetery to cemetery to find the remnants of the tall man's work. As they say, it's always the same. Some people appear to have died a natural death, and sometimes they're murdered. We end on a crimson cliff, a chasm separating our heroes and the tall man. He says there are thousands of him, in dimensions we cannot possibly imagine, and that his need for Mike is now finished. Then the gold sphere appears. Is it Mike's gold sphere from Phantasm IV? We can only presume it is, because his eyes turn gold and the sphere hovers before his face for a few moments before it flies away. There are only two gold balls in the entire series that we ever see. One explodes from the tall man's face when he's frozen at the end of part three, and the other is the gold ball that is extracted from Mike's head at the end of part four. This implies that both the tall man and Mike are different from everyone else and thusly connected. Mike's ability to harvest a gold ball has been the primary focus of the tall man throughout the series and what makes Mike special. Throughout the series, it seems that the tall man is putting Mike through a series of tests in order to determine his abilities, but also to determine his potential as a replacement for himself. Adverse to past films, the tall man's focus has shifted from Mike to Reggie. The question is, once Mike's gold ball is removed and the tall man states he no longer has use for Reggie nor for Mike, what is the point of Reggie's torment? After the gold ball is diverted, Chunk kamikazes and destroys the tall man, allowing the rest of the group to escape. In my favorite scene, after collapsing into the grass at the institution, Mike appears to Reggie in a seam between universes. The world becomes what it truly is, decayed and burning. Mike throws Reggie a shotgun. This is reality. Who's barreling down the alleyway in a 71 Kudu with brand new chain guns? It's Jody, bitches. Or at least this dimension's version of Jody. Lonely stretch of highway. Where are we gonna go? We're gonna fight harder. We're gonna change tactics. We're gonna go north, where it's cold. Really cold. The bastard hates the cold. There are two valid schools of thought theorizing the series' meaning and conclusion. There is one physical Reggie truly battling dementia, and the entire Phantasm universe is a psychological construction, confusing and obfuscating his consciousness, with the tall man representing his ultimate foe. And in the end, Reggie dies peacefully, with Mike and Jody holding his hands, and the mental image of riding off into the sunset with them to fight another day. While this is a valid interpretation, my personal perspective considers the ending differently. The death of the Reggie we see is not the only Reggie. I prefer to believe that there are, as postulated in the films, infinite parallel universes with infinite realities, dreams, and memories, and that we are, in some ways, joined through a shared consciousness. Just as there are infinite tall men, there are infinite Reggies, Mikes, and Jodies. We can see this as an abstract representation of a diseased human mind, or we can entertain the idea that while one Reggie died, another is armed and ready. And after all, even if the only Reggie did die, where does consciousness go after death? I'm just so grateful to see you both. It's a hell of a way to start a trio. We flash to Reggie dying in his hospital bed at the institution with Mike and Jody. If we are to believe that this is the same dimension as the original, then Jody never died, and Mike never went to the mental institution in part two. This doesn't really gel with the story we've been given, but again, it's open to interpretation. Don't miss the end scene. Rocky, who still looks hot as ever, picks up Chunk after he crawls through a fork looking Looney Tunes charred. They join the ride with ginormous fears on the horizon. So where will we end up? Why do I love this series so much? Its use of abstract science fiction and intellectual thought about parallel universes, alternate dimensions, and the human consciousness. We're all linked in some way. 
but you can't possibly summarize the series in one video alone. This is our best attempt at keeping it concise and succinct as possible and tying it directly to Ravager and its impact. Do you think that it was all a dream or that Phantasm exists within a realm of infinite dimensions and realities? What did you think about Ravager and its relation to the Phantasm series? Let us know your thoughts in the comments below and thanks for watching Found Flicks.